So welcome along then to show number 10 of the lockdown shows and it's the second of our marketing episodes which we're holding in June. It is brought to you by the Exeter Chamber of Commerce and of course our friends at Bitpod as well and we're looking forward to our Zoom networking session at the end so make sure you hang around and join us for that if you can. Starting off today's show then we're going to hand over in just one second to Helen Scholes from the Exeter Chamber of Commerce and she's going to be talking about particular topics that we're going to cover during our July lockdown shows. Hi everyone and welcome to the second of our lockdown shows focusing on marketing. This week we'll be taking a look at marketing strategy for small businesses including how to get the best out of tight budgets. There'll also be presentations on PR, branding, video marketing and digital. In fact pretty much everything you need to help you get up and running as we head into July. Because according to the results from our return to the workplace survey the majority of businesses who responded are planning to open next month. Thanks so much to everyone who completed this survey. To view the full results, follow the link in chat. Speaking of July, our next two shows will focus on all things employment related. We're planning the content right now and we'd love your input. So keep an eye out for the polls during the show where you can vote for your favorite topic. Happy Friday and enjoy the show. Thanks very much indeed, Helen. Okay, time to introduce our first guest for this afternoon and it's Joe Holdham from One Voice Media. Joe, good afternoon. Thanks very much for having me, Matt. Joe is here to talk to us about restarting your PR activity post lockdown. Joe, the floor is all yours. As we emerge from lockdown and businesses start to reopen in different ways, you might want to consider when to restart your marketing and PR activity. While there isn't a single answer to this question, every business will need to find their own right time. We've come up with a few tips to consider when relaunching your marketing activity is a good time. Number one, listen and learn. To know when to restart your marketing activity, you need to get a good idea of your uh, an understanding of your audiences. Spend some time listening to your audience through social media. Read posts from suppliers, customers, influencers, and even competitors to see how your industry and your customers are reacting to these uncertain times. Reading posts across all your social media channels may give you some insight into the mood of your audience and how quickly or not they might be willing to move beyond lockdown. How have your customers reacted to marketing-driven social media posts from competitors? Are they engaging with social media posts? Have they reacted to your own posts over lockdown? And have these reactions changed over time, or are they largely the same? Number two, we think. This unprecedented pause in our usual business is undoubtedly tough, but it can be a great opportunity for a communications audit. Take a look at your internal and external communications over the last few months perhaps even this year, and honestly ask yourself, is this right? Importantly, ask yourself, is it right for now? Look back at your key messages. What are they? Have they changed? Do they need to change? Review your communication platforms and channels. Look at how you reach your audience and check that it actually works. Do people read your newsletters? Are customers engaging with social media posts? Check your company tone of voice. Is your tone of voice always consistent across all your communications? Is that tone of voice still right for now? Should it change to better match your business or your customers post lockdown? If you are a B2B business and work with different sectors, consider tailoring your communications where possible. You may, for example, adopt a different tone and message for the hospitality sector than for the manufacturing sector. Consider how you communicate. People are being flooded with information. So this is important. Few people will have time or desire to read hundreds of words on a website. Princess Hay recently created a video both to, re to inform and reassure people as they began to reopen. Could video be a useful option for your communications? Number three, plan. Planning ahead is never wasted. Clear objectives, goals and strategies are needed in any marketing communications at any time. So definitely get your ducks in a row, but Number four, be flexible. Like never before, you will need to factor flexibility into your planning. If you start with the expectation that the national and global situation might change, you can quickly, you can make sure your plans are flexible to change quickly. For instance, if you schedule social media posts to save time, you might want to reduce how far into the future they are set, or even swap to posting on a daily basis instead. Don't put anything in place that is too far ahead and will make it difficult to undo. 
Don't make any assumptions about your industry or market. There is nothing usual about our current situation. Number five, internal comms. Always important, often overlooked. Make sure your staff are up to date, bring them along with new ideas, change in position or shift in focus. Keep them fully briefed so they understand any changes and can ensure consistency of message and voice. Ask your team for ideas. Have they had specific feedback from clients or suppliers? Do they have an understanding of your sector that could be helpful? Make sure you include any staff who are furloughed. It's important that any furloughed staff are not left out on a limb and still feel part of the business. Figure out the best way to communicate with them and give them a chance to feedback and support the business. Watch out for information voids. This is a time when people can feel nervous and unsure, and although you may not be able to provide certainty, keeping the channels of communication open is vital. Get creative. The usual summer parties may not happen this year, but there are lots of ways to include all staff in something fun. At One Voice, our summer party will now involve the team joining in a live online cooking workshop from our homes. As workplaces start to return to the office, think about how you will communicate to your employees the safety measures you have in place. For a small business, this may be a Zoom call or similar followed up with an email. For a larger company, you may consider making a film for reinsurance. A film can bring the new normal to life and show how any changes might work. Number six, be sensitive. In the rush to get your business back on track, remember some people will have lost loved ones. Some will have felt a significant drop in income or had a really difficult time during lockdown. Equally, some people will feel nervous about re-engaging with the world, unsure of how to behave and what to do for the best. Sensitivity is going to be key to finding the right tone to move forward and keeping your audiences engaged. And number seven, prepare. What can you learn about how your business coped with this crisis? Lockdown came suddenly and affected every aspect of life. No one could have predicted these strange times, but with hindsight, can you identify policies, strategies, procedures that would have been useful to have had in place as we suddenly went into lockdown? Could any of these be useful to your business at another time in the future? Consider what would have been what could have been in place in March that would have been that would have benefited your business and make this part of your crisis planning. Excellent stuff, Joe. Thank you very much indeed for your time today. It's been great, thanks very much. Next up, we have Jonathan Alder from branding and design agency, Alder and Alder. We also have some exciting news for you because Jonathan is gonna be helping the Exeter Chamber of Commerce work on its own branding over the forthcoming year. Now, of course, we'd like your feedback on this, so we have created another poll. Please help us by taking part in it. Which of these characteristics do you think are most important for the Chamber in 2020? Could we ask you to pick up to three of these, please? And they are progressive, inclusive, connected, relevant, champion of the business community, informative, fun, open or flexible. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed for your feedback. Right now to introduce Jonathan. Jonathan, thank you for agreeing to be on the show today. You're welcome. Really glad to be a part of it. Jonathan is going to be talking about branding for the bounce back. Jonathan, it's all yours. This afternoon, I'm going to talk to you about how you can use your brand to help you to bounce back from the impact of coronavirus. So to do that, I want to start by talking about what your brand is. Now, your brand is the image that you project to other people. Now, there are two elements to that image. One is how you look and one is how you behave. Understanding how to use those is really important because it's these two elements that influence what people think about your business. It's these elements that influence the opinion that they form. And what's really important to understand is that your brand is the opinion that other people have of your business. So the more effectively you can manage that, the more effectively you can influence how people behave. In a recession, that's really important, the ability to influence what people think. So what I want to do this afternoon is to give you three tips on how you can use your brand to influence what other people think about your business. My first tip is be active. It's really important that you maintain your marketing and your advertising activity and maintain your brand profile during a recession. It helps you to reassure existing customers that you're still there, but it also helps you to reach out and engage with new customers. In a recession, marketing is often one of the first things that's cut as businesses try to reduce costs. 
research in April identified that 50% of UK businesses were planning to cut their marketing budget. But interestingly, research has shown that businesses that maintain their marketing spend are typically more successful coming out of a recession. There's been lots of research done over the past 100 years looking at recession, looking at marketing activity during periods of recession. The researchers looked at several different factors, but the consistent element that they found is that those businesses that maintain marketing activity, maintain their advertising through a recession, are more likely to be successful coming out of that recession. So if you can maintain that spending, it's a really strong strategy. Now, a really great example of that is Kellogg's. In the 1920s, Kellogg's were one of the leading brands of cereal in the US. As the Great Depression hit in 1929, they, they along with a company called Post, were the market leaders. As the recession hit, the two companies took quite different approaches though. Post cut their advertising, cut their marketing, whereas Kellogg's increased their marketing. As a result, Kellogg's were able to establish themselves as market leaders. In the deepest part of the recession, in the, in, during, during the Great Depression, when the US economy was at its lowest point, Kellogg's enjoyed a 30% rise in their profits. What they were able to do by maintaining their spend, maintaining their marketing activity, was establish themselves as market leaders and also build a platform to give them the growth and make them the global business that they are today. The reason this strategy works is that most businesses in a recession will cut their advertising. What that does is it creates the opportunity for you, if you maintain your activity, to fill the gaps that they leave. It allows you to reach more people with your advertising, with your marketing activity. So my first tip is be active. My second tip is be consistent. In a recession, when so much is changing, consistency of the, the image you project is really powerful. As I mentioned at the beginning, there are two elements to this, how you look and how you behave. So we're going to look at each of those briefly. So thinking about your brand identity, how you look, is really important to be consistent. What that helps you to do during a recession is to raise your profile and to help people, make it easier for people to recognise your products and your services. Now, Coca-Cola are a great example of a really consistent brand. Their, their logo has remained unchanged for almost 130 years. Um, and interestingly, their logo, probably one of the most recognised logos in the world now, wasn't created by a designer, it was created by their bookkeeper. But they use it consistently and it's a very, really powerful tool for them. But it's not just their logo that they use well, it's also colour. They use red consistently so that their packaging and their advertising stands out. It's easy for people to recognise and notice. The other element of, of consistency is thinking about consistency of the way you behave. And this is all about the values within your business. The values in your business are what determine the behaviour. It determines the way that you do business. And what's really important during a recession is that it's the way that you behave, it's what you do, that influences how people will perceive you. The way you behave, the way you do business will help to influence their opinion and to help to demonstrate the values, the qualities that you want people to associate with your business. In a recession, the ability to build trust is really powerful, not just for existing customers, but also with new customers who you want to do business with. So my second tip is be consistent, not just in how you look, but also in how you behave. And my third and final tip is to be relevant. It's really important during a recession when so much is changing, there's so much upheaval, your, consumer, your customers are going through all kinds of changes, both in how they live and how they work. So if you can remain relevant to them is really, really important. How they work, how they live is, is changing. Their needs and expectations have probably changed. So it's really important that you consider how you might need to adapt as well to remain relevant to them. So take some time to think about and understand your customers and how their world might have changed. There are two questions you really need to consider. The first is what are the problems that they might be facing and therefore how will your products or services solve those problems? If you begin to understand those, you can begin to identify the opportunities for you to be relevant. Now, a really good example of relevance is Amazon. Now, they are a huge business, but uh, all of their products and services that we're familiar with are all built around their, uh, their, their purpose, which is to be Earth's most customer-centric company. 
And if we look at what they do, all the services and products they provide from when they started out as an e-commerce business, all the way through to their, their current kind of manifestation as this technology business, all the products and services they deliver are focused on the customer. They understand the importance of, of, of identifying what the customer needs and being relevant to that need. It was estimated last year that 90% of UK adults, that's about 40 million people, use Amazon. So that's just a demonstration of, of what you can achieve. You know, the reason people do that, the reason they are so, so popular, so, so um, used so consistently, is that they manage to remain relevant to their customers. They understand what our needs are and they deliver services and products that meet those needs. So that's tip number three, be relevant. Now, I know those examples I've shared are all big global companies, but those lessons, those three tips are just as relevant for you, for any size of business, for each of us here sitting, watching, watching and taking part in this show. So during the next 12 months, there'll be lots of change and lots of upheaval. But if you can understand how to use your brand to influence the opinion that people have of your business, to influence what people think about your business, it will give you a fantastic opportunity to drive your success through the recession and into the recovery that follows. So my three brand tips are be active, be consistent and be relevant. Excellent stuff. Be active, be consistent and be relevant. Jonathan, thank you very much indeed for your time on this afternoon's show. No problem. It was really good to be here. Next up is Catherine Almond from Bray Leno. Catherine, thank you for your time this afternoon. Thank you for inviting me, Matt. Catherine is Head of Insights at Bray Leno and is going to be talking to us today about developing a post-COVID-19 marketing strategy on a budget. Catherine, please take it away. Anyone running the marketing for a business right now is likely to find themselves on the horns of a dilemma. You know you should be planning for the long term, but the reality is that you need to take a very short term view just so that your business can survive. Long term planning might involve new product development, uh, exploring new routes to market or something quite radical like rethinking your whole proposition or business model. But it's difficult to get your head around big issues like this whilst you're busily stripping out costs and trying to keep yourselves competitive while all around you seem to be losing their heads and slashing their prices. So how do you square that circle? Well, you focus on your customer, 100% on them, not your bank manager, not your supply chain, not your distribution arrangements, not even your marketing plan. That can all fall into place later. Just focus on your customer. All too often in marketing, we concentrate on what we want to say what our message is, what we're trying to sell, why our widget's better than somebody else's. But it's not about us, or it shouldn't be. It should be about the customer or potential customer. What do they need, even if they're not yet aware that they need it? And how can we address those needs? We call this being customer-centric. It's about looking at every aspect of your customer's interaction with you. So how do you flip things round and start thinking in a customer-centric way. Well, I'm going to talk to you about three different things you can do. The first is to mine any data that you already have. And this can be really basic. Is there one day of the week or time of day when the phone rings off the hook or you get lots of answer phone messages? And then of course, there's a wealth of insight to be gained from your digital data. Even if you're not a specialist, you can try to identify where and why you're losing people who have shown an interest. And on the other side of the coin, what digital activity have you run that's been particularly engaging? Learn from what's worked, and ditch what hasn't. And focus primarily on what's changed since lockdown. We know that consumers have been profoundly impacted by COVID-19. So you need to drill down into the data to see what impact it's had on your business and consider which of those changes are likely to last longer term. A few of the th changes that, that we've seen um, and we think might be permanent or semi-permanent semi are that e-commerce will continue to grow. Older generations are becoming much more relaxed about using the internet. We're stream seeing much stronger community ties and long may that last. We're seeing some rejection of overt consumerism and a greater appreciation of or affinity with nature. So how could you incorporate some of those trends in your strategy going forward? The second thing you can do 
is to actually just talk to your customers, find out more about what's going on in their world. You can do this informally if your business means that you've actually got quite a lot of contact with them. But of course, face-to-face -face contact is a bit limited now, so you might want to do some proper research. This could be in the form of a short online questionnaire or some depth interviews on the phone. And remember that research, the research process itself can be a way of actually improving your relationship with your customers. The fact that you value their opinion makes them feel good and you should thank them for their time with something that they'll appreciate. Some free product, discount off future purchases, purchases a prize draw or a donation to charity. It needn't cost you much, but you can find out a lot of very useful information to guide you. I'd suggest asking questions about things like the best and worst aspects of trading with you. How easy is it to deal with you? How easy is it to get product information? What about ease of ordering? Speed, accuracy of delivery. Have things improved or deteriorated over the past few months? Which of your competitors have people used or might they use? And what was that like? And finally, you can ask them if they could just give three words to describe your business. Then the final thing I'd recommend in terms of customer centricity is what I call the Carlsberg exercise. If Carlsberg did whatever business it is that you're in, what would they do? Do this with a group of your staff. I wouldn't do it with customers because you might raise their hopes a bit too much. If you can get an external moderator who's skilled at running brainstorms, so much the better. But it's not essential as long as you really do stick to the golden rule of brainstorms, which is every idea is a great idea. Capture every idea and then look at the themes. So we've got three sources of information that we've looked at. Mining existing data for insights, researching customer opinions on your business and your competitive set, and finally, brainstorming the absolute gold standard in your sector. And frankly, this is probably where you're going to find most of your most lateral ideas. So armed with all of this, I suggest you don't start with what you're going to do, your strategy and your tactics, but with what you want to achieve. Define your priority objectives for the short, the medium and the long term. Then you can work out how you're going to get there, what you need to do and how much it's going to cost. So let me leave you with a few things that you might want to think about. Firstly, unless there's good reason not to, focus on your core business, your best sellers, your essentials. Secondly, keep thinking about improving your customer experience. What can you give that will cost you little or nothing, but that will be really appreciated by your customers? Exeter City's life-size cutouts at this week's match is a great example. Number three is to keep thinking about your distribution. There's a great example here with Borough Market in London. They have 181 stallholders and all of their stallholders have clubbed together so that customers can place one order and get one single delivery from multiple stallholders. Number four, remind customers that you've been there for them in the tough times. And you can be really overt in asking them to help your business going forward. You could also consider setting up member get member advocacy or loyalty schemes. And finally, keep thinking about how you can improve your e-commerce offer and make it as easy as possible for people to buy from you. Superb advice, Catherine. Thank you very much indeed for your time this afternoon. It's been a great pleasure and I hope what I've said has been useful to people. Next up, we have three updates from city centre businesses as we emerge from the lockdown. Callum. It's over to you. Hello there, my name's Callum and I work at Exeter Library. Now, while the library might not technically be open to the public, we are running a free library delivery service. So if there's any item on our shelves, any books or DVDs or CDs or anything, and you'd like it, please do get in touch and we can send it directly to you, either by post or by hand. You can get in touch by email, exeter.library at libraryslimited.org.uk or by phone, 01392 407 027. If you don't know what's on our shelves, our staff can walk you through it, or our staff can browse the shelves for you and pick a book that we might think appropriate. We've been doing this for a couple of days now, and it's just fantastic to finally be able to get our stock in the hands of our customers. We look forward to hearing from you. 
Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Cal Kidan from Sancho's. We are an ethical clothing shop in Exeter. So when this all began, we did most of our business in store. Um, of course, we had to close our store, so we then kind of changed our operations so we could do it mainly online. We spend a lot of time kind of communicating to people via our social media channels and our newsletter um, and try to take them along in this journey with us. And it's been OK. Like, um, and we are really grateful that we've had the support of our community, both locally and nationally. Um, yeah, we feel really, really lucky to have everyone um, on board with us. And now that we're moving into the next stage of lockdown with shops reopening and the high street reopening, we are conscious that we're going to have to kind of change our offering a little bit so that it suits our customers, but also so it suits us. Like like everybody, we've really enjoyed having you know the pace of life slow down a little bit during lockdown. Um, and we'd like to you know, maintain that so that we can come to work as our best selves. Um, so one of our ideas is to open up our shops for appointments. Um, so we are reorganising our shop, which was mainly there so that we could sell products, so that it's more of a studio where we can communicate our brand values, our vision, um, have people come in, try stuff on, um, enjoy a drink, um, and just spend time with us, really. And we're hoping it's going to be something that's adopted. Uh, people will be able to come from July, so probably from the 4th of July, um, although please do check our website to be sure. You'll be able to book online and come see us in store at... 117 4th Street and we'd be really happy to have you. So yeah, thanks for watching our little segment of the video and maybe see you in store soon. Hi, I'm Emily from Inexter and I'm here to tell you about the 15th of June. 15th of June was the reopening of non-essential shops for the city. And I can tell you the businesses were very excited but also very nervous. A bit like going back to school after the summer holidays, never knowing what's in store for you. When I got off the bus there was a definite buzz in the city and the footfall was up by 120% on the previous week, and that was also seen on the Friday and the Saturday of last week. People were getting used to the one-way system that's been put in place, but it takes a while for those things to get used to, about 21 days to get into a new habit. But everything was running really nice and smoothly. Businesses were very excited and welcomed lots of, business, of customers back again. Now we've got that one date sorted. Here's to the 4th of July. Thank you to those three businesses and good luck with everything that you're doing in the very near future. Okay, time for another poll for you now. If you look on the screen for you there, we're looking for some guidance about the sort of content we can help you with and produce throughout July. We want to talk about people, that much we do know, and that's from a, uh, an employee and an employer perspective as well. So please let us know your thoughts by selecting something from the poll in front of you now and we'll base our forthcoming shows on the things that matter to you the most. Thank you. Okay, it's time to find some of the best things we found in terms of tools that you can use online on the internet this week. Starting off with LastPass, which is described as autopilot for all of your passwords. Not only does it remember them for you, it can also generate very strong passwords to help keep you protected online. Next up is Trello. Trello lets you work more collaboratively and get more done. Basically, Trello's boards, lists and cards enable you to organise and prioritise your projects with others anywhere in the world online. It's a really great tool. I've actually used it myself several times. Now, Ghostery is a tool which helps you browse the internet smarter by giving you control over the ads and the tracking technologies you experience. This can help you speed up page times when they load, eliminate clutter and protect your data too. It looks a really useful tool. We have a couple more tools for you to try out this week. First up is Momentum. It's a personal dashboard designed to eliminate distraction and provide inspiration, focus and help with productivity. I've already had a closer look at this one myself and may well be using it to help me with my own productivity. And finally for today then, this is Awesome Screenshot. It's called that because it's awesome and it allows you to share your screen through videos and screenshots really easily. There's a free version which looks pretty useful and it will allow you to record not only your screen, but your webcam too. Next up is someone you'll probably recognize because he, alongside his wife Angie, is responsible for recording and editing this lockdown show. It's Alex from BitPod. Thanks, Matt. It's really nice to be part of the front end of the show for a change. Normally, I'm sitting behind, pressing buttons and not really appearing on the screen much. Alex is here today to talk to us about video marketing and how to make that stand out. Alex, the floor is yours. Video is now well and truly part of our marketing. 
What I want to do today is to share with you three opportunities that I think are really worth considering. So the first one is about improving your video calls. Now we're all making video calls every day. We're using Zoom, we're using Microsoft Teams and all the other different systems out there. It's staying even after this pandemic, the efficiencies of video calling will mean that it will replace many, many meetings um, with all the cost savings and time savings, but also the technical capabilities, things that you can do in a virtual meeting that you couldn't do face to face. So it's really important that you look and sound your absolute best. So the first uh, a bit of advice I've got for you is to get your laptop up off your desk um, so that the camera is around eye height. This is a much better look, it's much more flattering. Um, the, the laptop on the desk with the camera pointing up means it's what we call the up the nostril shot. It shows off all your chins. It's just not the best and most flattering view of you. So safely move your laptop up and probably the best way of doing this is to get a laptop stand and then maybe a separate keyboard and mouse, um, which is actually better for you anyway in terms of posture. So the next thing you need to do is to tilt your screen down. And what I mean by this is your head and your eyes should be around one third of the way down the screen. I see continuously lots and lots of um, video conferencing calls where people have got their head vertically in the center of the screen. Now this is not a look that's used in video or on TV. Um, if you look at any of that professional video footage, you'll see that the head is always one third of the way down the screen. It's called the medium close up. Now what happens is the bottom of the screen just around the armpits um, sort of cuts here and then there'll be a little bit of headroom. What we're seeing an awful lot now on calls is the headroom is um, just huge. Uh, there's so much wasted space up there that doesn't do anything. So try and orientate yourself better so that you look a little bit more professional. Um, the next tip I've got here is to look at the camera. And I know the problem is that you're looking at somebody on the screen and of course you wanna look at their eyes because that's what we do when we communicate. But that means you're not actually looking at their eyes from their perspective because they're looking at the screen and you're looking down because your camera is above the screen. So an easy way to solve this is to make your um, video conferencing app smaller, i.e. not full screen, and then move it up to the top center of the screen. Now I know this means that people will be smaller, but what it does naturally is it moves your eyes much closer up to the top next to the camera, and it means that your, um, your potential client or your, um, uh, your, uh, your existing client or your referrer is actually communicating with you much better. They're, they're seeing you look at them, which makes a, a stronger connection. Um, so the next thing is about lighting and backgrounds. Now I'm gonna make a quick point about backgrounds here. Um, Please avoid virtual backgrounds. I know they're fun and uh, they can be, uh, uh, yeah, they can be quite, um, yeah, so, something quite different. But actually, professionally, they don't really look good. Um, if you blow up the video to full screen, which of course is happening at the other end when somebody views you and you start talking, actually you'll see that there's all sorts of issues. Um, bits of you might uh, appear and disappear randomly. Um, and of course you might find that there's some strange edges going on. They're great fun for sort of family stuff and, and friend calls, but actually in the business world, it's much better to go for a nice, simple, straightforward background. Now I'm cheating a little bit. I'm here in our extra studio and we've got a nice lit background, but that's not to say that you can't create something that's fairly straightforward. So either choose a wall that's nice and clean uh, and non-distracting, or if your, your background is more complex because of the nature of where you're located, just tidy it up. Just have a look at it on the screen. What is there that might distract people? Um, is there anything you can do to make it look better? In terms of lighting, the best thing you can do is to use daylight. So arrange it so that your window in your room is facing you, not behind you and, and ideally not to the side of you. Uh, if the light is in front of you, you'll get a nice even light and that means that it will be easy for your, uh, your viewers at the other end to see what you look like and your facial expressions. Um, if the lighting's behind you or you've got another light source like another window behind you, try and arrange your camera so that there's nothing bright behind you because your camera will try and automatically compensate for this and it can mean that uh, either you look like a silhouette um, or your uh, background looks like there's some sort of nuclear war going on. Okay, my final point here is if you can, buy a better external webcam. They solve so many problems. One, you can arrange the screen how you want it to and have the angle of the camera correctly, but also built-in cameras really are fairly poor quality. And unless you've got a recent MacBook Pro or, or another laptop that's got good cameras built in, most of them are not particularly good quality. Try and get a widescreen microphone if you can and expect to spend at least 60, 80, up to 150 pounds on a decent webcam. Anything less than that is not likely to be that much better than what's in your, uh, your laptop. Same goes for a microphone. Um, 
again, test it. Some of the better webcams have got good microphones in, um, but if, if, if your image is okay from your current webcam, but your sound isn't, then you need to be looking at an external USB microphone. Again, expect to spend at least 40, 50 pounds to get something that's good quality. So my next point is about information videos. And anybody that knows me will know I'm an absolute fan of making information videos. So I've talked about this loads in the past, but here's a few reminders. So the first one is to think about frequently asked questions. What are people asking you? And of course, we're not gonna be able to go to networking events in quite the same way, maybe, maybe for some time. And of course, the beauty of networking events is it's a great um, opportunity for you to demonstra demonstrate your expertise, your experience, and your capability. So you can do this with video. So make some valuable videos about things that people want to know about, helpful stuff. You're not giving stuff away because if you can make a video in two minutes um, that gives away your entire business, you've got bigger problems. So get those videos out, share them on LinkedIn. Of course, you can use them on any social media platform. You can embed them on your website as well, and you can get them on YouTube. And YouTube, there's some great things you can do with YouTube SEO, it's not difficult. Just research some good titles, some good descriptions, some keywords. Um, you can gain popularity on YouTube fairly easily with minimal effort. Um, lots of good articles on how to do that online. So my final point is about webinars. Now, recently webinars has been a huge thing for everybody, especially us. We've been involved in creating, managing and supporting lots of different webinars of all different sizes. And there's three different reasons why you might create a webinar. The first one is discovery. You might want to just kind of up your PR, remind people who you are and what you do. And of course, one of the great ways to do that is to get out there and to share your information in the, the longer format, sort of uh, 30 to 60 minute uh, events. Um, you don't charge any money and you don't really expect much back from it other than a great bit of PR. Uh, the next thing is you can use a webinar to generate leads. So more specific information, you have uh, uh, mandatory registration. And of course, what you're doing is you're capturing email addresses and of course, people's permission um, for you to communicate with them further. And finally, with webinars is uh, to earn money. And this is something that's really gonna take off in the future. In fact, I'm gonna talk about it in a second. Um, making webinars um, for uh, people to attend that pay is gonna to have to be a part of the future because people are not gonna be able to continue making webinars for free, but people need this information um, and it's gonna be a, a really big thing. So just definitely watch this space. Okay, so now I'm gonna hand back to Matt. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alex. So this is something we've never done on the lockdown show before. Basically, this is an advert. Alex and I have started to work on a project together, which we'd like to tell you about today. I mentioned earlier that making webinars to earn money is an opportunity for you or your organisation. But as this is quite new to most people, we saw that there was a need to share our expertise to help you do it better. So Alex and I have created a webinar which will teach you everything you need to know about creating your own webinars. We're running this as a webinar, of course, delivered as five one hour sessions over an eight day period. So you don't have to wait too long to get started. We'll be covering everything from the actual planning of your webinar through to pre-production, production, presentation and, of course, the technical side of things, too. This webinar series is suitable for everyone, from beginners to professional marketeers. If you want to boost the visibility of your organisation, generate valuable leads, or make money from your attendees, then this is definitely for you. So if you really want to find out how to make webinars work for you, please click on the pop-up box and reserve your place today. Okay, so that's the end of this advert. And don't forget, if you want to do this on The Lockdown Show, please email inquiries at exterchamber.co.uk. And now, back to you, Matt. Thanks, Alex. There we go then. The Lockdown Show's first ever advert, and you can have one of those too. Get in touch via that email address. Okay, time to move on now to our headline act for today. And this gives me immense pleasure to introduce you to a gentleman by the name of Alastair Banks, who is the co-founder of Optics Solutions. Al, thanks for joining us this afternoon. It's my absolute pleasure, Matt, although you could have done earlier and not just before we were able to have another haircut because uh, I'm sporting quite the bouffant here, as you can see. Let's not talk about hair now, shall we? Some of us aren't so blessed. Now, Alistair is here today to not talk about hair and hairdressing. He's here to give you some of his vast knowledge of digital marketing. Alistair, it's over to you. 
So I watched the last episode of the lockdown show with great interest uh, because it was about marketing. And there was some really, really good advice there, which some of the messages that you're going to hear today are going to be quite similar. But that just goes to prove that there's some great companies out there and great companies within the chamber that can really help you guys. So if you need help, you should reach out to them. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to focus today on digital marketing because it's what I've known for the last 20 years, right? So... I want to start by focusing on three kind of core messages. The first one is strategy. Now, having a good digital marketing strategy is really important. Let's put the tactics aside for a second um, because it's incredibly easy to waste money, um, to re uh, waste resource, um, to, to blow your budgets if you don't have a strategy. Now, this doesn't have to be some mammoth document. It can just be a few pages. And, and really what you need to focus on is a couple of key things. Firstly, you need to focus on your objectives. So what are you trying to achieve? Is it to raise your brand? Is it to uh, generate new inquiries? Which presumably for a lot of us it will be. Um, once you know those, you can then work out which are the right digital tactics to use to achieve those things. And then the final piece to the puzzle is to work out what KPIs or key performance indicators you're gonna use to measure the success of that strategy. And once you've done all of those things, you can look at where you are now, you can work out where you want to get to, and then you can work out what the gaps are in the middle. So my first point really is actually having a proper digital strategy is, is really the first thing that you should do. Um, we've put together a free tool which you can find on www.mydigitalpulse.co.uk <clears throat> which will take you through 10 or so questions very quick and it will give you a score out of 100 as to how well you're performing when it comes to having a digital strategy. So check that out. The second point I want to talk about is personas. Now you would have heard Kirsten and Jennifer both talk about knowing your audience in the first session about marketing, which was really, really important. And I, I'm not going to go into it in massive detail now, but we call it persona marketing in, in digital. And it's all about understanding who your customers are, where they hang out, what sort of messaging you should be using for them. There's a great free tool called makemypersona.com, which is given out by a company called HubSpot. Um, it's free, um, so you can go to that. It guides you through the process of creating your persona online. So uh, in terms of creating and knowing your audience, it's a vital, it's really important because it will mean that you don't waste budget and resource again. Um, so that's one of the very first things that, that I wanted to make sure that I got across on this video. The third point is to remember, especially if you run a team of marketing people, is that not everyone can be an expert in all areas of digital. The person that you want to do your pay-per-click campaigns, maybe very kind of analytical in spreadsheets, looking at decimal points, that kind of thing, is not necessarily the same person that you want running your social media, being your social butterfly and attracting people to you. Um, but a lot of people forget this and, and don't seem to give it the weight that it needs. So my best advice here would be do what you do best and outsource the rest. So now that I've focused on those kind of three core areas, I just want to jump into a few tactics that might be useful in this time. So the first one is email marketing. Across the digital space, we're seeing a lot of agencies that are starting to say that email marketing is coming back to the forefront. And there's a really good reason for that is that keeping in uh, communication with your current customers is more vital uh, than ever at the moment. It's harder to win new customers, so making sure that you retain your current customers and keep in communication with them, giving them value, giving them education, um, telling them about what you're up to is really important. We've actually made our email marketing tool free to set up at the moment because we just recognise how vital this is. So Email marketing, are you doing it? Are you keeping in communication with your customers? If not, then maybe you should turn to that. The second point I want to mention is something called local SEO. So SEO stands for search engine optimization. It's all about getting your, li your site listed in the likes of Google. But there are a few things that you can do to help you perform better locally, which is probably what a lot of us will be wanting to do. So, so when they're searching for web design companies in Exeter, that's a local search. Now, two really key areas that you should focus on here, Google My Business, which is when you type in your business name, it's that bit on the right hand side that has a, is about your business. It's almost like a, a website within Google. 
if you haven't claimed it already, it will give you the opportunity when you do that to, to, to do so. And within Google My Business, you can put up loads of information about your business, what you're up to, your services, your products. You can put photographs, videos, events, all sorts of things. So it really is worth investing some time in creating a really good GM, uh, GMB, Google My Business, presence. Um, that will help you from a, a local perspective as well. The other thing is something called NAP, N-A-P, stands for name, address, and phone number. And one of the problems that Google has and businesses have is that they often change address. They move, right? You may have done the so uh, yourself the same. Now, when, when that happens, people don't go and change their address around the internet. So Google gets a bit confused about where you actually exist. So making sure that your NAP is uh, regular and, and consistent across the internet is really important. Um, if you go to moz.com and you search for their NAP citation tool, it, you'll be able to find it. My third point is on personal branding. So personal branding is something that if you've heard me speak before, you'll know that I'm very passionate about. And it's hard to market, right? It's, it's particularly hard if you're a brand to market. But what's not so difficult is if you are a personal brand. So if you're a person who can get educa educational or valuable content out there, such that it attracts people to you. So have you thought about positioning yourself, maybe your senior team, maybe other members in your team, helping them uh, on sites like LinkedIn, for example, or if you're in a more B2C business, Instagram and Facebook, to really build up their personal brands and get active so that they position themselves as experts in your industry. Because by doing that, you will definitely, believe me, attract more business to your business. And then finally, my, my final point is video. Now, we've all got very used to sitting in front of a camera, um, uh, whether it be on a webcam or on a laptop, on places like Zoom and Teams and Skype over the last few months. So let's turn those newfound, um, ex that newfound expertise into creative videos uh, about our businesses. Let's think about product demos, talk about our services, showcase behind the scenes. Um, it doesn't have to be professional quality, although obviously that's best. You don't have to do it in a professional kind of um, studio or anything like that. Although talk to people like Bitpod, who is doing a session today, um, about that if you want to. But creating video will get you in front of more people than you may have ever got in front of before. We've actually started during the lockdown our own YouTube channel called Optics TV, which is something where we get guests on, we talk about digital, we talk about things that aren't digital actually and it's something that's really it's, it's been great for us to do it's been very very interesting but it's got us in front of far more people than we probably ever would have done so before thousands in fact so make sure that digital marketing or sorry make sure that video is part of your digital marketing mix al you're a star thank you very much indeed for your time this afternoon it's my absolute pleasure matt really enjoyed it i hope you guys got something from it very best of luck Okay, that's it. We are done and dusted. Show number 10 is in the can, as they say. It's been all things marketing. Next up on the 10th of July, it's all things people. We're going to be talking about employees and employers from the feedback that we collated from the poll that you filled out earlier on in the show. So thank you very much indeed for that. We'll create the show especially for you. Now on the way, we're going to be networking very shortly indeed. So we're going to pop a link into the chat box for you. But of course, we'd love you to join us on the 10th of July as well. So in the bottom left hand corner of your screen right now is the pop up box where you can register for the next episode, episode 11 of the lockdown show. But in the meantime, if you're not going to come and join us with the Zoom networking, please, we'd love you to be there. But if not, stay safe, stay happy, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks time. Cheerio.